Okay, it is April 22nd, 2019, and we are back with James Gosling. Hello. Hi. So, um, we were sort of talking about, or finishing up the story of your time in graduate school. Um, so, you talk about your dissertation committee? Uh, yes. Um, so I um, had a had a odd arrangement that I had two thesis advisors, um, Raj Reddy and uh, Bob Sproul, and then on my thesis committee was um, was also Ivan Sutherland and Guy Steele. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ivan was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you talk about your dissertation topic? Um, the, the, the title of the thesis was The Algebraic Manipulation of Constraints. And I had, you know, I, I always like building, edit, uh, like doing, you know, editing drawings. And it always seemed odd to me that uh, most drawing editors were just like lines. And um, at some point I had seen the, 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 one of the sketch pad videos or something. And you know, the, the fact that, he, the, the, that Ivan had put you know, constraints into it. Um, and I thought, well, that was kind of, that was kind of cool. And I started looking at systems that, that tried to be kind of like that. And um, when, when in, in, in Ivan's thesis, he uses um, kind of two, two techniques. One that's, that he called just constraint prop propagation. You know, it's like you wiggle this, and then that wiggles, then that wiggles, then that wiggles. Then that and that, but that sort of falls apart when there are cycles. So he would um, go from that to uh, numeric uh, relaxation, which is you know computationally really really heavy, and often would lead to surprising results. Um, usually not surprising in a good way. Um, so I so I just said, well, could I do a, a constraint satisfaction system that was based on symbolic algebra rather than 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 um, doing it uh, numerically? And so that's what I did. I um, you know wrote lots of, of stuff to do um, symbolic manipulation and um, trying to you know to take the graph. Where there are cycles, and then rather than trying to solve it numerically, turn the turn the subcycles into um, expressions, or you know, because a subcycle ends up being a system of, exp of 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 equations, and and then try to like solve the system and turn it into one equation, and and then try to come up with, you know, I tried various schemes for. Um, you know, what people would consider surprising versus not surprising. Um, because all too often these constraint systems are, are under-constrained. So you kind of want to change as little as possible. Um, you know, I, I kept finding that um, you know, most of the, the systems of equations had you know, obvious solutions at like zero, zero, zero. Um, and, you know, that was never very satisfying. You just find your whole diagram just kind of go um, And that wasn't very good. So it, it's like try to find the, the minimal solution that satisfies the constraints or the, the minimal change. Um, and so that was kind of fun. And with Sproul and Sutherland on your committee, it was 
I mean, tilted you heavily in a, in a graphics-oriented direction. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, neither of them are, I mean, Ivan is very famous for his work in graphics, but, um, well, both of them really are all over the map. I mean, you know, they're, they're, um, they're pretty amazing guys and they do all kinds of things. Um, and, you know, my whole thesis committee was a real privilege. And the other thing is that um, even though you did have, you know, uh, Ivan and Bob um, who were, who had implemented systems, your dissertation still had to be theoretical. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was kind of, well, I mean, I, I built a system. I mean, I had to build the code too, but um, the, I mean, I had tried to get several thesis proposals kind of like through the system at, at, at Carnegie. Um, and one of the, 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 the pushbacks I got from was, was always, it's just not theoretical enough. You know, so there, there, there had to be something that felt sort of theoretical to people. Um, you know, so like the, the underpinnings of what's now the Java Virtual Machine. Um, I had been hoping to get that, to you know, because I thought that that was a really interesting set of ideas, and maybe that would make a good, good thesis proposal. And it's like. Raj and Bob were like, uh, you know the, you know the, the the faculty has to has to sign off on, sign off on the topic, and that one just had not in, they didn't have enough opportunities for like the equations and their improving and crap like that. So, and I think we touched on that a little bit last time. Um, the, the virtual machine stuff, so you'd been familiar, so that was for this emulator that he did um, for the PERC, to run PERC software on the VAX. Right. And so how, how familiar had you been with um, things like UC, UCSD Pascal and the small talk um, bytecode uh, you know, precursors? Um, not a lot. I mean, most of what I learned about UCSD Pascal, I learned from picking apart um, PERC binaries because the, the, the PERC folks had just used the UCSD Pascal um, P code and there were things about it that were great and things about it that were not so great. And um, although I was looking at them through a very strange lens, namely, you know, I wanted to turn it all into VAX machine code. And there were places where I had to work extra hard and places where eh, it was, it worked really, really well. Um, and then, um, you know, I talked with some of the, the, the small talk folks, you know, in following years um, about the, the small talk byte code. Um, and you know, there's, uh, you know, I really hadn't used Smalltalk much at all. I mean, I had played around with it on a, on a Xerox Alto a little bit, but. Oh, which, which um, Smalltalk people had you been talking with? Um, Peter Deutsch, mostly. Because he, he was at Sun at the time. Okay. Um, so yeah, you finished your PhD in 1982 or 83? 83. 83. And um, we talked a little bit about this last time. You then went on to IBM. Yeah. Yeah. And so then at the time at IBM, you were working on the Andrew window system and uh, UI toolkits. Yep. 
and that that was also related to CMU, right? That was something right. So, up. so what had happened there was that um, um, CMU had got this giant grant slash um, cooperative development agreement with IBM. And um, IBM built a building on campus, and um, you know they wanted to build. Um, I mean, it sort of started out as a fancy workstation kind of thing, um, and and so they wanted to to hire some people, and the 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 theory was that half of the people that worked at this institute would be. CMU employees and half of them would be IBM employees. And um, so I became an IBM employee. I, 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 you know, technically my manager was at, at IBM Yorktown and I, I spent some amount of time at IBM Yorktown, but not a huge amount um, because the the project that we were building, which was like a complete workstation, although, uh, I mean, initially the workstation itself didn't exist. And in fact, I had left the project before the workstation came into existence. Um, it was, and we started trying to prototype, prototype it on, a, on an IBM PC, which was um, comically awful. Um, and, you know, I managed to convince them to, 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 to buy us some uh, Sun workstations. And those were, those were just, like, gloriously great. And, uh, um, and I ended up sort of consulting with a bunch of, of the groups at IBM, so I I spent way more time on airplanes than I was really comfortable with um, going to um, principally um, Austin, Texas and, and, and San Jose, where two of the major groups were. The, the group in, in, um, in Austin was building the workstation itself and the group in San Jose was building the displays. Um, and the, I mean, I kind of got into some of that through my connections at Yorktown because I had actually independently interviewed at Yorktown. And one of the projects there that I thought was really cool was this um, uh, microprocessor called the Romp. It was a risk machine. And um, it was just the, the coolest thing ever. Spent a bunch of time you know, talking to people who had built the romp. And um, so, this, so this, this workstation was supposed to be this, this fusion of the romp processor, um, you know, the rest of the system built by the folks in Austin, and the, the display accelerators and controllers and all of that built by the folks in San Jose. Um, and, and so I ended up like visiting all of these folks over and over and over again, um, which was mostly a, an, an exercise in figuring out how, how, how comically bizarre a giant corporation could be. And this predated the the RS six thousand series. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I think it eventually uh, fed into that. Um, but yeah. And the so you had not been involved with the Andrew Windows system back at CMU at all, or had you been? Uh, I was the guy who wrote it. Oh, you were the guy who wrote. It. Okay, <laughs> so that yeah. was yet what yet another one of your projects that yeah. you had done. Yeah, I, 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 I was the guy who originated it, um, and you know, 
built the first versions of it. Um, you know, for the first year or so, I was the only person working on it. And was that another one of your attempts to turn, to do a dissertation out of that work? Or? No, no, no. That came after I was graduated. Oh, okay. So you were, oh, so we were working at CMU. Yeah. So I so I graduated like right at the beginning of '83, um, and and I I only worked for IBM for a year and a half before I went. Ah, this is crazy. Because um, it was really clear that their risk-based workstation was going on a completely idiotic direction, and there was nothing I could do to to get them to do anything other than you know drive the bus into a brick wall. Um, so then, after a year and a half, I went to to Sun, which is kind of where I should have gone in the beginning, but. What exactly was the problem with the IBM project? Um, so it wasn't so much the IBM project itself, but everything kind of around the IBM project. So, um, I mean, one way to view the problem with the IBM project was that it was way too successful. Um, you know, the ROMP processor was really, really good. Um, and, you know, based on all the, the early work, it looked like they could build and sell and, you know, for a tidy profit, uh, a workstation for $10,000 that probably would have outperformed their $10 million um, mainframes. And that was kind of the core of the problem, right? That, that all the mainframe folks, you know, every time we had reviews of this thing, the mainframe folks would come up with, with, with ways to, to cripple it by, and it was mostly these, 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 these kind of ways of, of inf putting requirements on what, what standards they uh, followed and what kind of interconnects they did. So, um, you know, while the, the, the early designs had all I.O. going through some kind of a DMA channel, um, th through some path that I do not understand, they ended up um, creating this re requirement that the disk drives had to go through um, a serial channel, so they they they, they, they sort of for, force a lot of PC compatibility, um, but PC compatibility in ways that made no sense at all. Um, so I was I was there when like like the very first units were delivered, and I was kind of horrified that you could DMA from the mouse, but you had to do a sort of programmed I.O., which is like byte at a time for the disk. And when I sort of dug into how that came to be, I was like, you guys are so fucked. Um, and, you know, the, just putting it together how the, 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 the politics around the project had so crippled the project. So it was like, this isn't my fight. I'm never going to budge this one. But most of the problems were hardware and I.O., not, not the Windows system. You were given more freedom there. Yeah, because nobody had any clue what, that, what a Windows system was, really. Right? I mean, the, 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 the average concept of what a display was in IBM was a, one of those uh, 3270 displays. Um, and, you know, the kind of stuff that, that, that the Android window manager could do was just, did not make sense to them, so they didn't actually care much, because it was just too weird. So, um, 
We talked a little bit about um, you joining Sun last time, getting recruited by Andy, basically. <laughs> yeah, and then saying, no, the romp will kill you. And then discovering that, oh, IBM killed the romp. So no worries there. But when you, um, when you got to Sun, you essentially worked on yet another Windows system, News. So that, was that just a natural thing? Um, well, I was, when, I, when I was hired, I, was, I, I wasn't actually, you know, for, for the first f few months, um, Bill and Scott had sort of said, you know, hook around and, and look for a project figure out a project to work on and um, I was what one of the things that I had a hard time with it at the uh, at Sun at the time was that the that the OS and they were just barely starting to use BSD um, it didn't it didn't do paging um, it was the, the sort of early um, it was still the, the so sort of an, an early version of um, the, the the Unix kernel that that would just sort of block page entire entire processes, um, and the, a few other things, and then the Windows and they had a they had a Windows system group, um, and. I wasn't exactly a fan of the way it was being built, um, if only because the, um, f for a variety of sort of peculiar reasons, I had built the Ender Window system using uh, the network. And I originally did it because um, you could only have one process, you know, un unless you could edit the kernel could only have one process accessing the display at, at a time. And, and so I, I did what I thought was originally a, a, a fairly disgusting hack, namely I forced all rendering to be done by one process and then the other processes communicated to it over the network. Um, after a while, I sort of decided that that was actually a good idea, not a bad idea, and it worked really well. Um, and so then I, when I got to Sun, um, the Windows system that they had ran in the individual applications, so there was a copy of it in each application. and. Um, they went through a pretty complicated dance to sort of switch ownership of the, the, the various hardware registers back and forth because um, the hardware didn't understand multi multiprocessing at all. You could really just have one process at a time. Um, and you know that had its own issues too, um, but it also meant you know, because there, there wasn't paging, there were like multiple copies of the same code uh, using up memory, and memory was really precious. I mean, you know, a machine with a megabyte of RAM was a big one. Um, what year was this? This was 84. 84, yeah. That was the year you started at Sun. Yeah. So I, did, so I decided that I would, um, and, and also, um, Bill was really eager to have me do the the window system thing, so I did, um, and that turned into the news window system, which actually worked remarkably well. Um, but then it 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 you know there was this horrible industrial politics with DEC and company. It was it was quite bizarre. And you worked with Warren Teitelman? Yep. Yeah, on the news. 
project? Yeah, well, he was the the manager of the the sort of Windows System and Graphics group, and the the group was sort of two parts. One was the the part that had been doing the um, the 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 Windows system that was there when I arrived, um, and then. Um, Bill wanted me to, you know, was encouraging me to do this other thing. Um, so we actually had two window system projects, and um, so for the first year or two, I was working alone on news. Um, and then there was this other group, and Warren sort of managed both of them. But why have two? Um, why not? <laughs> um, well, the other one was there, had been there for, um, you know, for six or ten months before I got there. Um, after seeing what I had done at, at Carnegie Mellon, Bill became convinced that they were kind of going in the wrong direction. And so he kind of set me up as the, as the sort of competing counter argument. Um, and yeah, it was weird. What was exactly your like line of reporting it sounds like you know you were, you were kind of brought in almost at a very high level, you know, by the founders of the company. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I knew them all, yeah. and, and you know, like I think I said the last time, I mean, I I had worked with Andy before, um, but as, as as John Gage used to say. Um, Sun doesn't have an org chart; it has email. <laughs> um, and you know, it was you know an awful lot of the early people at the time, which very pointedly did not include Scott, were 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 kind of you know hippie commo, commie weirdo freaks who didn't believe in org charts. Um, you know, Scott was um, kind of a straight-laced kind of guy for that, but he, he kind of went with the flow. Um, so, yeah, the hierarchy was a very weak notion at Sun. So it wasn't like you were in research or you were in a product group. You were basically, just, you could have been, been working on anything. Yeah, so when I was first, you know, it's like, like when I first graduated and I um, was trying to figure out what my first job would be, I, I had this thing in my head that I really wanted to work in a research lab. And for most of my time at, a, at, at Carnegie Mellon, I had really wanted to work for Xerox Park. Um, but then I get towards the time when I'm graduating and Xerox Park was just falling apart. So it didn't, and I, and I interviewed at Xerox Park sort of before it completely crumbled. Um, but by the time I was graduating, it was pretty much, um, pretty much gone. But I still wanted to work at a research lab. And so when, when Andy approached me the day that that, um, that Sun was founded um, and IBM was you know twisting my arms and they had this this romp processor that was clearly way better than anything that Motorola was building um, I kind of went with the research lab because that's what I'd always wanted to do and then um, after a year and a half of figuring out, what a straight jacket the the research lab at IBM was was wrapped in. 
uh, I sort of realized that, that Sun was more like a research lab than any of the research labs. Um, so I went, went to Sun. And for the longest time, Sun didn't have an R&D department, a, 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 a separate research lab. Um, but that was, that was okay because most people at Sun were just, you know, nutcases in the, in the best possible way. Did you look at um, DEC at all? A lot of park people went with went to DEC. Taylor went to DEC and stuff. Yeah, and yeah, no, I, I, I guess I, I had gotten kind of religious about the whole uh, Unix thing by then because I, I had been involved in some of the like Vax VMS versus Unix wars and that involved doing a bunch of like evaluations and work with VMS and I was like oh lord no I don't want anywhere near that stuff um, um so why why did X Windows um, beat out news in the market. Um, I, I, you know, personally, um, the the amount of money um, that that whole consortium put together um, that heavily went to marketing was just completely overwhelming. Um, and, you know, several people at DEC had said that, you know, the, you know when, when NFS first came out, um, DEC had a network protocol that they were using for their, their equivalent of a, of a file system. And it was, it was crap. <laughs> and, and NFS won. And several people from DEC had said, we're not going to be NFS again. Because um, news was starting to get pretty popular. And they thought that this was completely awful. And so they, 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 they actually, um, you know, when they sort of announced the, 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 the X consortium, um, pretty much every player in the computer industry was there and they held this um, this press conference and they actually had security guards um, barring people from Sun. We had sent some people, I wasn't one of them, to try to attend this 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 press conference so we could at least find out what they were what they were saying, and um, you know anybody who said that they were from Sun, they were, you know, security guards were like, kept them out, and it was it was like, really guys, and that was Michael Dertuzis, right? Was I don't know who was yeah, running the X consortium. Yeah, and I don't know how how any of that stuff happened. I just know that the that the couple of people that we had sent to, to try to attend the press conference were like physically restrained from entering. But. I mean, with NFS and news, I mean, it seems like very early on Sun was you know, already branding itself as not just a workstation company, not just a Unix company, but also a networking company. Oh, the the, the networking was was from day zero. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the things that really attracted me to Sun was, you know, one of their foundational bits of religion was networking, and. You know, I had come to really believe that networking was a big deal. Um, and, you know, I, IBM clearly 
did not believe it. networking was a big deal. They, they had this evolving communication standard called SNA. Um, it was it wasn't a standard. It was a it was a basket of random bits of whatever they just sort of put together. Um, it was you know as my father would say a dog's breath breakfast. Um, and DEC had this thing called DECnet, which was um, not quite as lame as SM SNA, um, but it, it wasn't nearly as, it wasn't anywhere close to being as elegant as the whole TCP IP suite, which had a pretty strong um, ancestral relationship to all the stuff from Xerox PARC. The PUP BSP and TCP IP were very, very close parallels. But XNS was still in play at this time, right? Yeah, but that had left Park, really, and and it it kind of fell apart. And 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 that was more that wasn't more so much a technical comment as it was. Um, Xerox trying to milk this thing for money. And one of the things about TCP IP was that, you know, they, they, the, 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 there wasn't really any commercial interest in charge, right? That, that it was all about getting, getting systems to talk together. And since, you know, the systems that talk aren't, are just a vehicle for people to talk at a level um, that included more than just voice. So the, the news project, at what point did that, that your work on that finish? Um, I, I mean, it, 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 it sort of took a bunch of like just really weird turns, but I was pretty much done by um, 89. I just couldn't, couldn't take it anymore. Um, so between that and the start of the Green Project, were you working on anything else? Um, I was trying. Um, I don't know. Nothing really went anywhere. There was about there was about a year of floundering. So we did talk um, about the beginning of the Green Project last time. Um, sort of want to drill down a little bit more into um, sort of Patrick Naughton's primal scream email. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so he had, because um, he was one of the people that was working on the news window system, and you know, a bunch of us were like really, really disenchanted. And he had um, interviewed at 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 Next, um, and he was really disturbed that you know that these guys were doing something really interesting. And, you know, the, the fact that they were sort of trying to do something that was kind of out of bounds from the normal computer industry. Um, and he, you know, he, he, I can't exactly remember that first email, but it was, it was, it was kind of like, you know, son is missing out, you're just, Right. And um, yeah, there were a bunch of us who were kind of like, yeah. Um, but but Scott's reaction was was kind of interesting, which was was essentially to say, you know, and, and so 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 myself and a couple of other people, um, Ed Frank, Mike Sheridan. Um, kind of joined in this this sort of like yeah you know this this just doesn't seem 
doesn't seem like like we're doing the right things. And so Scott said, well, why don't you just take some time and figure out what the right thing would be? And um, so we did. And Patrick decided to not leave and, um, you know, because I was, I was kind of like floundering um, and um, trying to get stuff started, but it sounded become a little more political than I could, than I was really happy with. And um, so, so we went off in a corner and um, we did a few road trips to, to, to talk to people who were um, building sort of, sort of systems that were more tailored for like actual humans. Um, and that sort of draw, drew us into conversations with a lot of people who do consumer electronics and the way that things were being um, digital systems and um, and consumer things were being sort of integrated together. Um, and then we decided to start to try to explore the space. And since we were engineers, we started trying to build prototypes of things. And we got a bunch of people to, to join us. Um, uh, this, this sort of manifesto got written um, most, I think mostly by Mike with Ed and everybody else sort of piling on, but you know, Mike held the pen. It was this, this weird document called Behind the Green Door um, for all kinds of reasons besides the fact that the, the little pod of offices we were in had a green door. Um, well, besides the movie, what would the other reason be? The green door. I mean, we had a physical green door, and um, Apple had this new operating system project going on that was called Pink. Uh. <laughs> so, so we figured that, you know, if we're if we're going to needle them, we might as well pick something with a color in it. And our office space had a green door, and then there's the obvious movie re reference. And it was just compelling. So you probably joked about it. Oh yeah. Talk on the phone, or you behind the green door, and yeah. Yeah. How how familiar were 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 all of you uh, with Next and what they were doing? Um. So Somewhat. Um, I mean, we had bought a couple of Next machines and had played with them. Um, you know, in in my time of floundering, one of the things that happened was, um, you know, because I was still doing work on things like graphics device drivers and that, was that um, the the first Next machines had this weird grayscale frame buffer that had, a, it was a two-bit frame buffer, so that you got uh, four pixels in a byte, but it gave them four levels of gray. Um, so it was a way of, of getting, you know, more colors, but only a smaller number of, uh, you know, sort of, without, using too much RAM for the frame buffers. And so there was uh, some, some hardware engineer folks at Sun that sort of went, you know, that's actually really easy to do. It's like one extra chip in the frame buffer. And, and so there was actually, so they actually made a two-bit frame buffer and then said, well, let's ship it um, without having um, 
thought at all what it would take to do the software to support a two-bit frame buffer. And, you know, because of what it takes to, to build all the, all the rendering software, um, a two-bit frame buffer was a, was a big problem. It was going to be a huge amount of work. And it was just going to be huge. And, you know, I, I, I blew several months just on the warpath that, you know, you can't release this frame buffer. Yeah, sure, it does the next coolness thing in the frame buffer. But there's at least 10 man years of effort here. You either fund us to do the work or you don't. So far, you're not funding us. So the work's not going to happen. So how can you release this frame buffer with no software? So I blew, you know, like, damn near half of that floundering year was just fighting that battle. Um, and, yeah, um, you know, and, 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 you know, a lot of, of the main graphics folks at Sun had, you know, because of the way that X11 had worked, um, what that really did was it, 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 it caused Sun's, like, window system engineering to just seize up. Um, because we were trying to sort of respond to the X11 thing um, in retrospect, mostly in ways that didn't work very well. Um, and I was pretty ticked at the way that that had sort of unfolded. Um, and, and so we, we just sort of left that all behind and we just were like looking around and kept finding all kinds of interesting stuff sort of out there at all of these sort of com consumer companies. And it was, you know, it was this, 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 this combination of interesting, cool, and completely horrible. Um, you know, because, for example, they were all reinventing networking from first principles and making, you know, all of the mistakes that people in the computer industry had made only um, on average doing uh, just just doing appalling things. I mean, it was it was stuff that was people were doing stuff that was known to be stupid in the 60s. Do you have one example? Oh, one of my favorites was a a network protocol that had a. Um, the, the network protocol was meant to go over a, a serial bus, kind of like RS-232. The, the packets um, had really no error checking at all, and they had an 8-bit address. So, not going to work, even close. Um, and, you know, I tried pointing out that you know, serial lines, they lose bytes. Bytes get corrupted. You need to have some kind of integrity checks. And, you know, they just, uh, it, just talking with these folks was, was just really difficult. Because um, they, couldn't, they couldn't see why anybody would need more than eight bits for an address because you're never going to connect networks together and networks are never going to be big. It's like, yeah, wrong. I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm, I think it was really interesting that Scott McNeely, you know, was uh, maybe enlightened maybe, so to speak, to sort of let you guys just go off and start the Green Project? I guess it was either that or lose you. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, we were, you know, 
you know, we argued pretty hard about, you know, why Sun was was screwing up. And Sun was, or Scott was never a, a technology guy, um, as he, as he describes himself in college, he majored in golf, um, which I think is kind of unfair to Scott, um, but that's the way he would describe himself. Um, but he did have faith in people, and you know, you know, if we, you know, if, if the four of us said that Sun was screwing up, then maybe there was something there. So he was like, "Yeah, go, go take a take a stab at it," you know. And and this was you know this was a really vague, you know, primal scream because we couldn't you know you know early on we were having a hard time really articulating what was going on. So you know we went on these road trips and um, came up with a plan and. 90% of the plan failed and 10% succeeded, so. Earlier you mentioned, you know, there was green, the color thing was kind of a response to Apple's pink. How much were you paying attention to what Apple was doing? Um, not much because it was a deep, dark secret. Ah. <laughs> I mean, you know, the... The, the folks at Apple are really, really good at keeping secrets. I did feel that the UI of the Star 7 kind of reminded me a little bit of um, Hypercard and General Magic. Or was that just some sort of an aesthetic that was out there? The um, well, yeah, I mean, we were very much aware and thought about Hypercard and that. and. Um, you know, for for a while we were sort of thinking that 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 was kind of the way to go, but the you know if you looked at the the, the scripting language between behind Hypercard, it was pretty limited. Um, a lot of the things that people had been wanting to do were a little more complex. And, um, you know, even though it was, you know, from Apple and all of that, it was still, um, still built user interfaces that were fairly unfriendly. And so we were trying to, like, really kind of overachieve on the friendly side of things. I mean, we, we went full cartoon um, and, you know, kind of as a, as a way to, to be just like as far out on the, on the crazy edge as possible. And it really was too far out there. And certainly the, the performance requirements of building an interface like that was you know, it made, you know, if you've watched the videos, they're all kind of jerky and, and that. And that was a pretty wimpy processor that we had back then. Um, and a certain amount of the hypercard kind of thing of like going from frame to frame to frame. Um, you know, when you've got a small screen, it's kind of hard to do anything else um, because you can't have, you know, multiple windows on the screen that, that that's that small. Um, there's a limitation to, to just how much animation and how much sort of dynamic behavior you can do. And um, we really wanted to have things that didn't, did not look computery in any way. You know, so instead of having like buttons, we you know, with like boxes around them to signify that this is a button. You know, we did it with um, saturated colors versus more muted colors. So things that were satur more saturated were things you could press on. Um, and things like that actually worked out pretty well. Um, Walter Smith of the Newton Project actually said 
just the other night that he felt Newton's script was quite close to Java, but you didn't know, it's not like you knew what they were doing at that time. Yeah, we didn't know yeah. that, yeah. But I mean, there was the, given that you were moving toward, you know, small devices, um, Internet of Things, for want of a better word, I mean, the that was the same period, obviously, that there's yeah. Newton, there's Go, there's General Magic. I mean, did you, how much of the others were you looking at? Um, and why, why didn't you think of going in a more, you know, the device being your main interface like those folks did? Um, well, because the thing that, that, that was really pushing us was not so much the device, but the interaction of the parts of the ecosystem. And the way that the, the, the Java was designed, one of the you know, it, it, it had a bunch of really important influences. One was like, if you're on a network and you're amongst consumers, you have to be really, really serious about security. And then there are a whole bunch of like architectural follow-ons that come out of security. Things like if you looked at the, um, most of the security failures in the internet at that time, it, and it's still the same now. Most of them are due to, to bugs, and most of the bugs are things like buffer overflows um, and or null pointer exceptions. And you know the fact that in Java you cannot turn off like array subscript checking and you cannot turn off null pointer checking and you cannot violate the, the boundaries of, a, of an object. Um, those entirely come out of, of security con considerations. Um, and so the, you know, the, the, cracks, the, the cracks that come in through those things, which are just common these days, um, they, 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 they can't happen. Um, and then from you know my my experiences you know with the the, the, the Vax Perk translator it was like yeah if you design the language right you can get both um, semantics that feel like a like a pretty high level language and yet get um, really good performance um, you know so so things like um, a strong type system, um, and being careful about like you know what do numbers mean and yada yada. Um, you can you can you can get the kind of you know a lot of the feel of some of these scripting languages without giving up much if any performance, um, and without giving up you know. You know, trying to make things as secure and reliable as possible. Um, one of the things that that just came out over and over and over again with the consumer electronics folks was, you know, with you know, rule zero was was effectively, you know, thou shall not kill your customer. Um, and in the computer industry, particularly in the places where Sun was was competing. Um, it was all about performance, and if you could trade a little bit of, of reliability for a significantly large boost in performance, you would take that. Um, certainly companies like Craig did that all the time. I mean, with the way that they, that they did their floating point divide, um, you know, d division via Newton's method so that, you know, the bottom bits weren't always particularly accurate. Um, yeah, that just didn't seem like like the right trade-off. Um, so, yeah. We, you mentioned you went, you know, full cartoon. Could you talk about Duke? So. Where software agents, you know, I mean, th then the idea of being kind of in vogue at the time, 
Yeah. You know, well, Clippy and... Well, Clippy Vader. came after yeah. by, well, like, no, by Navigator, a couple of years. I guess. Well, and General Magic with agents. And yeah, so... Yeah, yeah and, 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 and we didn't see any of the General Magic stuff until afterwards, but um, particularly Mike felt that, you know, since this was a consumer thing um, and people were used to interacting with people, not machines, that to have something, you know, in their mental model that they were interacting with that was um, not mechanical, that was, um, you know, more of a person. Um, and um, we had this artist working for us, a guy named Joe Palrang, and his history had been all like cartooning. Um, he, he, I believe he's, he he originated the the Scrubby Bubbles character, oh. um, and and he did did a whole lot of different um, workups for you know possible designs. And one of the pro problems we kept having was that the the screen was really small, and you know Duke needed to look pretty reasonable when only like 50 pixels high. So there's not much room for complexity. And um, so Joe spent a lot of, a lot of time on you know, kind of like coming up with this really minimal shape that could still show, show emotion. Um, and we get a lot of you know, so so from the nose, you kind of intuit where the eyes are, and and since the 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 the, the top knot sort of gives you head angle, he could um, project a lot of a lot of emotion just with I mean what was essentially just a triangle with a red dot, um, and um, so we went with it. You know, it was. I mean, I think I think there were some of the designs he did that I, you know, from an artistic point of view, I I liked better. He did a he did a really cool um, robot character, that was sort of a sort of a sad sack robot that was, um, I guess, sort of like um, what's his name um, in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the um, Marvin, the the terminally, uh, but this was kind of like the happy version of Marvin, um, and but the problem was that there was no way to draw him small um, and make it come out right. So, um, and he had, and Duke worked really well, and Duke had had this kind of really nice friendly um, friendly aspect, and it was. You know the, um, I mean, there's the the the, the Disney code that um, anything with three fingers and a thumb is a is a cartoon character, and if it's got four fingers and a thumb, then you're trying to be realistic, right? Because Mickey Mouse always has has three fingers, and whenever they were trying to do more people that were tr trying to be not cartoons but humans in a scene. They always had four fingers, um, which I didn't know until you know Joe explained all this to me. It's like these these little hidden codes and things. Um, so we were getting into sort of talking about you know the the language. Um, you know I'm. When, when first person started, on, um, you hired a number of people from Next. Yeah. Well, not when it well sort of when first person started, but from the Green Project, there was nobody from 
Nixon, the Green Project. Um, but then when it went through that next, because that, by then, um, next was getting into getting into trouble. They weren't taking off the way they needed to. Okay. Um, so then, could you talk about um, the interfaces in Java and? How, how much was that influenced by protocols in Objective-C? Um, very heavily, right? So, um, it, so, so the, so classes in Java were kind of implement, influenced by classes in C++. But mostly they were influenced by classes in Simula. And the, um, one of the things, because I had used Simula pretty extensively, including having spent way too much time pawing through the compiler, um, or at least the original um, NDRE Simula 67 compiler. Um, And one of the things that really thrilled me about the way that they had done it was that for simula style classes, that, you know, there was this great trick for um, making them really fast to do uh, method dispatching, you know, the, the virtual function table, um, which oddly enough were the first written example of a virtual function table was in Ivan Sutherland's sketchpad thesis. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a grand and simple technique. Um, and then as, um, one of the things that I had a hard time with in C++ was the whole multiple inheritance thing um, because it had made it very difficult to do um, efficient dispatches. And one of the things that I liked about having interfaces as something separate from classes in essentially the, the, the Objective-C style um, was that it gave the language a, a hook to distinguish, you know, when it could use high-speed dispatches versus um, the somewhat slower lookup table kind of dispatches. Um, and you know, as, as time progressed, the compiler technology got to where um, actually almost all interface dispatches could be made as fast as class dispatch dispatches, but it requires some fairly ugly, ugly analysis, um, which on today's computers is straightforward and not a big cost. On, on machines, at that time where a megabyte was a lot of memory. Um, yeah, that was, that was kind of above and beyond. Um, but, it, but it was also a way to sort of, I mean, so some of the issues around like multiple inheritance get kind of, kind of messy. Whereas with interfaces, they're, they're a little bit cleaner. Um, and 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 so the the, the the we we had hired some of these next folks, and they really 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 liked the the Objective C, um, the Objective C technique, and and so I was you know and, and I, I mean I was literally getting people like walking into my office all the time, and I was trying to like be like, how can I make these guys happy, because they really have a point. Um, and it, it, it started to feel to me like 
you know, these kind of were different universes, the, the, the sort of interface style and the class style, and rather than try to mush them together in the sort of multiple inheritance techniques in NCI, I just sort of decided, well, it's actually pretty clean to keep them separate. Um, so that's what I did. Okay. So that was less driven by your personal experience programming in Objective-C and more by um, th these next folks that had come in. Yeah, and they, and they had really good arguments. So, you know, I listened and I tried to like figure out how to sort out both sides. What were their names? Oh God, I, I can't remember. Okay. Um, were there any other sort of things that they brought with them um, from Next or Objective-C that got into, the, into Java? Um, objective, uh, the, the, the inter interfaces were really it. Okay. Um, talk about the influence from Mesa. Um, yeah, I, I had actually used Mesa a moderate amount um, when I was in grad school, and... Is that because of Bob Sproul? Um, not so much, I mean, he... <laughs> um, but the fact that, that Xerox had made a, a grant to CMU of... of um, Altos. Of a couple dozen Altos, and... And, and stuff, and um, so I just played with them. I mean, I, you know, there was, you know, just all this stuff on the altos, and, you know, unfortunately the problem with the altos is that there weren't, weren't really enough to go around, so it was hard to do a, a serious project on the altos because they were um, a, a scarce resource. Um, but I could build stuff in Mesa and play with it, and, um, I kind of like the way that, um, that, that you know, sort of a, a basic threading model was like built into the language and how it made life cleaner. And um, the when I would used Simula, Simula also had um, coroutines built into it, which felt kind of like the the, the threads in in Mesa, but the you know, in, in, in Simula, the thread-like things were, really were coroutines, and so there was no asynchrony. Um, whereas in Mesa, the, there, there was asynchrony. And um, one of the, the interesting things at Carnegie Mellon in that era was that there was a lot of work on um, multiprocessors, and I had been involved in that and there were um, you know so I so I was in this kind of ethos that was all about parallel processing and um, the, the 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 way that they had you know done some of it by sort of building hooks into the language really cleaned things up and they they made it feel more like you know sort of the the multi-threaded aspects that appeared in Simula were great, but coroutines depend on there being just one core. If you try to do coroutines on on multiple cores, um, you get up you get all these concurrency issues that just get really complex. You know the the coroutines are attractive because you don't need locks and things. You can just do parallel processing and because you know when context switches happen, you can get a lot, you know, you can say A equals A plus one, and you don't have to worry about concurrent modifications to A or things like that. You mean threads? Or threads, processes, right. you pick a term. Right. You're saying that co uh, threads, not coroutines, are, are good for concurrency, but co coroutines were... No, no, so, so for co the, the, the kind of concurrency that happens in coroutines is is where where you do explicit switches okay right and and you 
you program in a style that feels like it's multiple threads, but really it, it isn't. And so you can never get um, truly asynchronous behavior. So if you've got a, in a coroutine, if you've got a, got a statement, you know that nothing is ever going to run at the same time because the only time you switch from one thread to another is with an explicit yield. Um, so you kind of get locking for free. Um, but the price of that locking is that you can only run on one core. And um, so things like, um, you know, Golang had a really nice concurrency story when they only supported one core. Um, and then as they sort of supported multiple cores, then they had to pull in all this stuff about having a very complex memory model so that you could talk about synchronization issues across, you know, all these cores with all these memory issues. Um, and um, I thought that Mesa had done a, done a pretty nice job of it. And so I decided that, that since, you know, multi-threaded processing was just the right thing to do, um, that it just needed to be built in. And by having um, language support, it got a lot cleaner. Mm. And, you know, Jim Mitchell, who had worked on Mesa at Park, had at some point joined Sun and, and helped out on Java? Um, or was that later? Yeah, that was quite a bit later. Okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Another thing you mentioned, um, you know, and I don't know if this was because of Mesa, but the, the static typing, um, well, you, you did mention in the context of security. Yeah. The, um, so it's interesting that like Mesa and, and then Java both had static typing, but dynamic binding. Yeah. And that's a very yeah. interesting combination. Yeah, well, so, so one of the lessons to me that came out of the, the Perk Pascal translator was that um, the, the bike, so, so if you look at, at something like, like Smalltalk that does not have strong typing, um, because they didn't really care about performance, it was not a really big deal. But, because um, I had read, the, read a bunch of the papers on Smalltalk, but at that time I hadn't actually used it. Um, but then the, the, the Pascal, which was a strongly typed language, and the type system percolated through to the, the bytecode so that there was like an integer add and a floating add and all the rest. Um, the thing that impressed me about that was that it let me generate really, really tight VAX code. And, and the fact that I was generating better code for the VAX than the C compiler. Of course, that was the C compiler of, you know, the early 80s. Actually, I think it was the late 70s. So that wasn't much of a C compiler, but still, I, I could beat it pretty handily. And, and all of the reasons that that, that, that worked was the, the static typing. And then, you know, as soon as you, you know, and the fact that then it gives you a way to do all kinds of analysis, um, and and I was actually doing, you know, a, a certain amount of like global flow analysis on the on the byte codes to put together the the VAX assembly code, and and I thought it was just really, it was just really slick that I could make things that fast. I do find it interesting that you know one of the sort of critiques of Java versus more, you know, dynamically typed languages like Python and Ruby is, you know, this idea that the, 
static typing makes Java code a bit too structured or a bit not as flexible as as something that you could do in Python. What would you say to that? Um, sort of yes and no. Um, I mean, personally, I like to reason about programs, and I like. I don't like debugging. <laughs> I like stuff to work. And one of the nice things about um, static type checking is that it can give you information about errors earlier. Um, and so the the, um, the 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 static typing gives the the compiler a lot of um, a lot of tools to use in, in analyzing your code so that if you, um, you know, it, it's unlikely that, 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 that people would really want to add one to a string. Um, and you, you can totally do that in Python. Um, and if you say Bob plus one, you know, it'll try to parse Bob as an integer, or will it try to promote one to a string? Or uh, is that con string concatenation, that, like the plus is overloaded to be, to mean string concatenation or something? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I always felt that, that, that the weak typing stuff was, was um, made things a little more wishy-washy um, it was less easy for the compiler to discover errors, um, and it was just way harder to build um, high-performance software. And you know, if you don't care about performance, then okay. Um, you know, so you know the way that you can um, like. You know, you know, if you look at something like like JavaScript, which is the where so much work has been done in the high performance implementations of them, those things are really complicated. You know, to make JavaScript fast is really really hard, and you take like variations of JavaScript, like TypeScript. So TypeScript is just adding types to, to, to JavaScript. And then that lets you build a, a runtime that is way faster um, and much more deterministically fast. And, you know, one of the arguments early on was you, you don't, you know, it's, it's quicker to type your JavaScript code. It's like, really? I mean, you're still typing VAR, so why not add, allow some alternate spellings of VAR, like INT and FLT. I mean, if it's, if you don't like doing names longer than three characters, um, you know, because JavaScript would go so much faster. If you could, you know, just, if you could just do the, the primitive types, um, and then the way that, the, that objects are done as um, essentially hash maps, um, you know, rather than, the, you know, you have to do a hash table lookup um, unless you're, you've got a, one of the, one of the very spooky compilers like the one in Chrome. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like zero, you know, it's, it's like, it's like one load instruction, you know, you type p.x, that's one load instruction in Java, and it's, it's a hash table lookup. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's a big deal. And some people care about fast. But some have argued that sort of um, a weaker typing system uh, can make programmers more productive in you know in the prototyping phase or in the 
Sure, but but you know, and, I, and so I'm I'm a big believer in prototyping, but my measure for like productivity isn't you know from start to when the first prototype starts to run. Um, I actually care about the production quality production quality code, which is why I I mean the. I care about doing as many checks as possible. I really care about checked exceptions. Um, I mean, I, I I lost a lot of time in my life over, you know, the way that like so many things in C, you can just ignore errors, and you know, it works on my machine. You know, when you say you know FD equals open of some file that contains whatever, and it works on my machine, and then you, 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 you ship it to people and it falls over miserably, but it falls over miserably in mysterious ways because you say FD equals open something or other. The open just returns minus one or zero or, um, and then it's not until like, way, way later that anything actually goes wrong, even though the source of the error was right here. Um, I want to know, you know, the, the actual source of an error. When did things go wrong? I mean, I, I don't care. I mean, I, I, I slightly care about how long it takes to get the first demo to work. What I really care about is how long it's going to take until something actually useful works. Um, I mean, when you're doing like a, a school project, it only has to work once. <laughs> but when you're in a, a, a more commercial project, commercial context, it has to work every time. And, and, and you know, things like type systems and checked exceptions are really useful to help you get to that sort of level of, of it'll just work. Yeah. Can you talk more about the exception handling? Um, so once upon a time, so when, when, when I first implemented exceptions, um, they, they, there were no typed exceptions. Um, and that was one of these ones where um, I kind of did, I mean, because part of the, the thing at the time was to build something that looked familiar to C++ programmers, people who knew C++ so that they could just look at Java code and, uh, and understand it. Um, so exceptions were, they kind of worked the way that they did in C++. Um, but there were, a f but Bill Joy really, really, really felt strongly about checked exceptions. And there was a point where he and a guy named Arthur Van Hoff, they, they literally came in in the middle of the night and, and implemented you know, checked exceptions. Um, and then I sort of went from being, oh, why, this sounds stupid, to being a believer. And I, you know, in the end, I really liked checked exceptions. Because um, I just kept finding that they were just saving my ass all the time. You know, and now I've, I've become pretty, pretty, I mean, I'm remarkably religious about exception handling these days. Can you talk about um, adding garbage collection? Uh, garbage collection is something that I had believed in for the dawn of time. Um, and when it comes to like security issues. Um, I mean, I, I started thinking about garbage collection when I was thinking about 
um, security. This may sound a little bit strange, but um, in the C style of doing storage allocation, um, when you free a pointer, you have to free a pointer at exactly the right time, right? You can't, you know, if you free it too late, you're wasting memory. If you free it too early, um, then somebody's going to use this thing that has been released and you end up with memory corruption bugs and a grand source of failures and that those those sorts of failures get particularly bad when they start being exploited as uh, security vulner vulnerabilities. And so it wasn't so much about allocation as it was about freeing. Um, and so if you just leave free out and you use a garbage collector, um, A, the whole system gets a lot more reliable. Um, B, it, it eliminates an awful lot of memory leaks. And see, it's just easier for developers. And at the time, garbage collection kind of had a, had a bad rap um, because the, the you know, garbage collection was, was kind of associated with Lisp. And you know, the, the universe was very divided over whether or not Lisp was a, was a good idea or um, an agent of the Antichrist. I mean, it was just it was just like incredible how people were divided over it. And I had written a lot lot of code in Lisp at the time. And you know, like like my whole PhD thesis was written in Lisp. Um, not a statically typed language. <laughs> not a statically typed language. Although um, the 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 Lisp runtime that I was using um, did allow static typing, so you could you could declare things as fixed nums and flow nums, and the compiler would actually use that. And doing fixed num declarations in particular at, at the right times, um, you know, I went through a pro through a bunch of processes of of tuning my thesis project and fixed num and flow num declarations at the right places made a humongous difference. Um, but I, I sort of figured that, that by the time I graduated I had uh, pretty much used my entire lifetime quota of parentheses. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, the, the whole bit of garbage collection, I just made life easier. You know, so when it came to, to Java, it solved some it solved some real problems and made life easier. Um, and if you can sort of break break people away from associating garbage collection with Lisp, um, it it actually turned turned it into a useful thing. So that even though um, Garbage collection had been around for a long time. It had never really gotten much in the way of mainstream adoption. And um, you know, people have done all kinds of studies that show that, that like a good garbage collector um, beats malloc and free pretty substantially. Um, you know, people were still sort of reluctant, but with Java, didn't really make a big deal of it. It just sort of snuck up on people. You know, you would just say new foo and oh, don't worry about free. Um, and then people just went, oh great. And then, then it was like, oh crap, you mean I have to use free when I go back to C? Um, you know, that, that, that felt to me like a real sleeper hit.
But given that you know you were initially targeting Java for you know these small consumer devices, was the was the non-deterministic nature of the you know the collector did that have any performance problems or no I mean the the you know Malik and free have have pretty strong non-determinism too mm. um, and although people mostly don't think about it if you look up the code for Malik I mean it still does searches um, free does all kinds of weird stuff to co coalesce things um, and they're they're not simple either and you know the the, the, the issue is with 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 a garbage collector is is often with what with, with the fact that it sort of takes a lot of these overhead chores and instead of having you know like low-level noise it just has a spike every now and then um, but on small memory machines the smite the spike is really teeny um, certainly on the on the um, on the original star star 7 the garbage collector pauses were like never noticeable um, but what was a was a bigger deal was we didn't have memory leaks um, and on a small memory machine memory leaks are a big deal <coughs> and um, the it was it was a fairly primitive garbage collector in that one but it did do did also do uh, storage compaction um, so if you can eliminate fragmentation and leaks well, that's a big big deal on a small machine um, we've already been talking about security um, you know what other sorts of security features were were important um, sandboxing is one of one of the yeah issues. sandboxing was a really important thing particularly early on with with applets um, you know the fact that you could take a piece of code surround it in a sandbox and you know have everything that sort of pokes out of that sandbox get inspected um, it fundamentally worked pretty well um, the you know the, in the early days applets had this 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 real problem that there were all kinds of security issues but the thing that was sort of annoying about them was that um, the sandbox was never the source of the security issues um, there were pretty much two flavors um, one was doing anything with the word security in a sentence on Windows you know particularly in the era of like Win 95 and Win 98 it was just crazy um, the things we had to do to make up for that were just crazy and the other was that that um, you know many of the issues were like were sort of um, sort of leverage attacks so you know early on we we did things like like trusting the domain name server and we would use you know so for um, sort of same or, or in secu same origin security checks we were using the DNS um, the problem is that the DNS can be attacked and a lot of DNS's were pretty insecure so people came up with these techniques where um, you could corrupt a DNS and then Java was more trusting of the DNS than it should have been and so then you could use that um, and you could punch a hole um, you know so we we were like became increasingly paranoid about DNS's but I mean DNS corruption is is, is a huge issue and um, it's been pretty thoroughly addressed um, you know it's been 
couple of decades of or three decades of people hardening and hardening and hardening the DNS. It's, it is sort of sad that, that many of the current vulnerabilities in, in, in the internet are people being, having been sort of short-sighted 30 years ago. Um, I mean, the fact that, that, that like a lot of email spam is just because the SMTP standard isn't nearly as tight as it should be. Um, there's no, um, there's no authentication really. Um, you know, when you get an email that says it's from um, whoever, you don't actually know if it came from there. Um, there's no no authentic. You know, and there are um, authentication extensions to the. To, to, to the mail trans to, to the, the mail transfer protocols, but they're essentially unused. Um, and I don't, I've never figured out why they're unused. Um, but you can get a certificate and um, you know amongst some of my my paranoid friends, they all have certificates and and they, they delete mail that, that, that doesn't come from a certified source. And, uh, but, you know, that means you, you know, if somebody, you know, if you buy a ticket on Ticketmaster, Ticketmaster sends you an email and you have no idea whether it actually came from Ticketmaster or somebody spoofing Ticketmaster. And they'll send you a fake ticket to, to Pink Floyd or whatever. And it's like, great. Here's your 50 bucks. That was a deal. Um, so I want to go back to sort of the, um, you know, because Java was sort of started off as kind of like being a better C++, the, and you, you know, you mentioned you had um, had a lot of experience with Simula, the object oriented part of it was always assumed from the beginning. Right? Yeah. There, was, there was never, you know, any any decision to not make it object oriented. Yeah, I mean, I, I had built object oriented stuff from the dawn of time. You know, for, for, so one way of viewing Java is that um, it was my way of taking a lot of interesting high-tech ideas, dressing them up in a way that like electrical engineers would understand. You know, so like like garbage collection, it was there, never made a big fuss about it, mostly because that would scare people away. Um, Object-oriented was a bit of a leap for people. Um, but I just had a, I mean, that was a really deep and abiding thing for me. Um, Unicode was, was, was strangely controversial. Um, and, and I was like super religious about it because it was just the right thing. Um, I was sick and tired of dealing with all these different encodings, um, and I would wanted to make it so that, you know, that it wasn't so crazy to, to, to write software that worked in a connected world. I mean, if you're, you know, if you've got a network and the network spans the planet, you gotta be able to send email, you know, I, you know, I, I you know, my my grandmother died a number of years ago, and I wrote up her um, the, the the little blurb that you hand out at, at 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 funerals for her, and there was so much stuff in her like family history that you you couldn't write in ASCII, right? And and um, I'm not exactly sure. well. I guess that was before like pages really existed on the Mac. 
Anyway, I, I was I, I had to write it in Microsoft Word, and one of the characters always caused Word to crash. Oh, I remember what it was that the. Yeah, I'd gotten a bunch of it for, a bunch of material from like the Icelandic consulate, and when I imported it into Word on the Mac, because it was a Word document from the Icelandic consulate that had, because um, the, the for reasons I, I don't really understand, but if you live to more than a hundred, the 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 consulate. Or, or the the Icelandic government does a, does a an official write up on you, and and they sent that to me as a Word document, which I brought into the Mac Word document, and I like loaded it up, and, and I discovered that there was one character that if I deleted that character, then Word would not crash. And it's like, oh. yeah, and I forget which one it was, but there were all of these weird runic characters, in you know her real name and the name where she came from and it's like it should not be this this hard um so unicode yeah H had you been uh, had you been a part of the object oriented community going going to oopsla these sorts of conferences or? not not much cuz i was never really a programming language person um, you know, I, I did Java not because I was a programming language person, but because I had a stack of problems and I kind of ended up going, the programming language is part of the problem. And I can solve a bunch of these problems by just doing yet another programming language. I mean, I had implemented compilers in the past, but never thought of myself as like, a compiler guy. I mean, the, I had done all kinds of stuff, and I was I was more more a you know do what gets the job done kind of guy. Um, and <coughs> Java is like is a pure object oriented language, right? So everything has to be a part of a class and in an object. Well, except for the primitives, uh, right? Which is where lots of people. But get cranky. Ints and uh, things are, are still, they're still objects, aren't they? Integers. No, and, and you know, so there are the primitive objects like int, and then there are wrappers yeah. that are true objects. So there's, a, there's an integer class, but that's a wrapper for an int primitive. Okay. Um, and I exposed the primitives because I could not figure out a way to make uh, a true, pure, object-oriented language efficient enough. Um, you know, the because they're, you know, like like in in Lisp. Um, Lisp is Lisp. Most Lisp implementations cheat in creative ways. So if if you try to be truly object oriented, then every object is everything is an object, which means that like if you've got an integer, it's wrapped in you know all the type information that that, that is an integer object, and you can have a pointer to it. But that means that that if that's what an integer is. It's something that is allocated in the heap. You can't just have its entire lifespan be in a register. Um, if you do some really exotic analysis, you can kind of make it happen. And, but even then, it's really hard to get a number of the, the primitive operations to really work. So like in, 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 in Lisp, it will represent um, integers in somewhat magical way. So, so if you've got a, a pointer to an object, 
um, and it's a pointer in your address space. And, and, and it's fairly common for uh, pointers to be on um, you, know, you know double boundaries, which would mean that they're a, the, the, al the address is always a, mu mu a multiple of eight, so the bottom three bits are always zero. So a common trick is to use those bottom three bits as, as a type code. And so if you've got an integer, then you know it's the top bits are the integer and the bottom three bits have got a, this is an int thing, so that you can have an integer and you don't actually allocate memory for it. And you can do that for seven primitives, seven primitive types because um, you need uh, one more type code, which is zero for the actual object. And that particular hack has been used so many times. But one of the things that, that causes trouble is that then the, 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 the things like equality can behave a little differently. Um, because as soon as you get like a, an overflow, you know, so if you take off three bits, then you've got 29 bits left. So if you've got, a, got an integer or, you know, whatever the, the layout is, you, know, you end up having a restricted set of integers that can be representative as these kind of like magic primitives. So if you keep adding and they overflow, then a real object gets created. And so then what happens is that, you know, if you, if you say A equals two plus two, in a pure object world, that would mean um, take this object to, and this object to, add them together and create a new object. And, and in Lisp, there are two kinds of, of comparison. There's there's equals, which is compare the value, which is kind of like a deep one that, that follows the pointers. And then there's EQ, which just checks the pointer. So if in this, it, you know, if you write A equals two plus two and then B equals two plus two, um, in the pure object-oriented way, those two plus twos have generated separate objects so that they should be equal but not EQ, right? So that the addresses to them are not equal. But if you do that, then every time you add one to something or you add two and two to get four, you'll get like this profusion of, of four objects. So you've got to try to collapse them. And, and so that's what the, the little, little, little hack of using the bottom three bit type codes ends up, ends up trying to do is making sure that, that all fours are the same. So that if you say A equals two plus two and B equals two plus two, then in, in a Lisp that has this particular hack, then A will not only be equal to B, but it will also be EQ to B. But if you keep adding to these, they will eventually overflow out of the, the range that this hack representation works, and most lists would then start allocating objects. And then, you, you know, if you, you can tell a lot about a Lisp implementation by just, you know, multiplying by two and, and, and looking for, you know, they'll, they'll usually start out where equal and EQ return the same thing. And then eventually EQ and equal you know, one will return true and the other will return false. And that tells you where the, 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 the caching hack is blown apart. Um, and that gives you this, 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 this re weird view of, um, of what like equality means. And, and yet if you don't do that, then um, performance goes to hell. Um, so you either get weird semantics or you get weird performance. Um, but you do at least get a, yeah. So I decided I cared 
less about object-oriented purity than sort of performance and coherence. One thing, um, you know, one critique of Java I've read is that sometimes programmers just want a free function and um, in Java they have to, there are no free functions so they have to make everything a, mem a, a method to a class and so they may have to just create an artificial class just as a boilerplate just to hold the function. Yeah, but that, I mean, that, that you know, when generics came, I'm well, um, sorry, lambdas came in like six or seven years ago, that, that went away. Yeah. Um, and that was, an, that was another one of these ones where um, it took a lot of long time for people to figure out a way to, um, to do it without any per performance apologies. Um, you know, the, the, even though I haven't been involved in really building or evolving Java in, in quite a while, one of the sort of mindsets that is stuck is is um, trying to do it without sort of introducing performance problems. And um, and a lot of the you know a lot of it turns into um, um, you know fairly rocket science compiler technology. So I'm interested to know how you know we talked a lot about Bill Joy. Um, how much you know he was I guess he was sort of overseeing the whole project. How much influence did he have, and what was sort of his role? Um, he would kind of pop in every month or two and we would talk and he would either, you know, he would spawn somehow. Some, sometimes he had, you know, things he like really pushed on and sometimes he didn't and sometimes I listened and sometimes I didn't. I mean, we had known each other for quite a while and we would talk and mostly things were just fine. We occasionally um, got a little heated, but not that often. What sorts of like specific things um, would you say were due to his influence? Um, well, certainly checked checked exceptions. Um, he really wanted to do generics and lambdas really early on, and I would have loved to too. But I kind of I, I pushed back pretty hard on it because um, the design space was just like gigantic, and the people who had done I mean the, the it was still a a a huge ground for getting PhD theses. And there was nothing like a consensus for what mechanisms work the best. And if we were going to do that in Java, we would have had to delay everything for, by a couple of years. Um, and I was like, we got to launch. We got to get this going. Right. So he was pushing more for like academic computer science features, and you were pushing more towards. Practicality. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a much more blue collar kind of guy than, than Bill is. I like to get things done. I like to build things that don't break. I like things that are fast. Um. So then, uh, let's see, we went over um, the, fa the creation of first person. Um, who was in charge of, who was actually like leading first person? Like a guy named Wayne Rosing. Ah, oh, right, Wayne, yes. Right. And Wayne had been, he was already, you know, he was, he had been part of Sun already. Right. For that. Right. Yeah, and as a guy to lead a, a, an R&D effort, he was pretty good. So, you know, what 
what was, how did Eric Schmidt's role as CTO affect um, the development of Java? He was almost entirely hands-off. Okay. You know, he talked about it on stage a few times. And he was in the org chart. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was John Gage's title at that time? Um, I think he, he always had, I, I think he was chief science officer, even though he's one of the least scientific people you've ever met. He is, but he's extraordinarily eloquent and very passionate and could give and could get science, scientific audiences or even non-scientific audiences motivated about just about anything. One of the, one of the best public speakers I've ever known. Um, so in 1994, one of your advisors, Guy Steele, joined Sun. Right. And so how much, um, did he end up working, working with, with the group to? Um, so he joined kind of later on, um, and he never really joined because he was always in Massachusetts. Oh, I see. Um, but in you know after after this whole whole first person thing, we had sort of decided that it was. That was just not going anywhere, and we decided to transition over to the internet. Um, you know, we had decided, you know, it was part of that hot tub thing, that um, you know we would stop trying to get the um, all the phone companies and cable companies interested in doing something, and, and we just decided just go for the internet. Um, but one of the problems was that the the Java spec was a wasn't really a spec in any real sense. It was you know, written more like the 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 Kernahan and Ritchie C book. Um, it was more conversational, and so Bill figured that we really needed a formal spec, and. You know, I told him, you know, I just don't have the kind of brain that can w do that and have it come out sounding proper. And and so Bill took a stab at it and he um, swizzled it into kind of programming language standards, normal form. And then, and then he kind of collapsed and went, I just, you know, he, there was just like so far he could go. Um, but Guy Steele was like an absolute grand master at fussing the details in language specs. I mean, he had, he had worked on things like Common Lisp, but um, so he got, so, so then Guy got pulled in and, you know, whereas I had kind of cruised over a lot of corner cases guy just has this laser for all the little dark corners and what exactly does shift left mean when the the shift count is greater than something or other and what exactly does m the mod operator mean in certain corner cases and just exactly how should we interpret some of the the waffly bits in IEEE 754? Um, and yeah, so 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 he really he really went to town. And you know the the thing that most people think of as the as the Java programming language spec is mostly due to him. Was he fleshing out things that hadn't even been implemented yet or was um, he describing There were them? there were a few things. I mean mostly 
you know, there were places where there were, were, were vagaries where things had been kind of glossed over. Um, there were things that, in hindsight, were just bugs. Um, sometimes he fixed them, sometimes somebody else fixed them after a guy pointed them out. Um, you know, there was all kinds of wafflishness in, in the smack all over the place. And um, Guy really sort of tightened all the nuts and bolts, and and uh, he, he 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 just did an awesome job. Um, before lunch, we mentioned um, Jim Mitchell. I know this is maybe skipping ahead a bit, but could you talk about working with him? Um, loved working with him. Um, he turned out to have quite a, a knack for politics that I sure didn't have. And his role was head of JavaSoft? Well, he, no, he was never that. He was certainly head of um, oh, Sun the, Labs. Sun Labs, right. Um, but, you know, he got, he got involved in some of the standardization efforts um, he got involved in a bunch of the, the politics with a bunch of the competitors. One of the things that, that sort of happened in that era that was sort of weird was that in around 93, I started developing really bad carpal tunnel syndrome. And um, by the time that 96 rolled around, um, my hands were essentially just clubs made of meat. I could have, you could have pounded a nail through my right hand and I wouldn't have been able to tell. Um, but I was doing all these different, you know, treatments and um, carpal tunnel is a funny thing and I didn't, I didn't get the surgery done until around 99 or so. Um, so since, you know, I could hardly even, I could hardly type emails. Um, you know, I, so, so I ended up having to be a talking head because that's most, and, and cause I, me in politics, it, it just don't, doesn't work. So, um, I kind of disappeared from things. Um, and, you know, people like, like, like Jim and, and that they really took over. Um, the, you know, the, certainly he was doing a lot of the relationships with um, other companies. And, um, yeah, we, I liked him a lot. Um. I think we were talking earlier about um, sort of the feature set of Java. Um, how were those sort of how were um, how were those decisions made? Like, were there regular meetings? Um, were they were they mostly made you know in Silicon Valley, or you know were were you flying over to Aspen to meet with Bill Joy? Um, well. It, it, that was sort of a function of time. For the longest time, the only one who made any decisions about it was me. Um, and and I sort of had this rule that, you know, I wouldn't even, you, you know, if there were other engineers who were using Java, that I wouldn't do things just because somebody said, oh, that would be cool. You know, until somebody was like beating my door down um, and really made a case. Um, and that's really the way things worked with Bill, too. And sometimes we'd have those discussions at Aspen, sometimes we'd have them other places. Mostly they, they happened in California. But I, 
I have a strong value to simplicity and um, I don't like complicating things unless they really need to be complicated so it needs you know for me it it, it requires a a pretty compelling case for for complexity and you know often when people want to do something like that they just sort of do whatever comes into their head and it, it's kind of like the first solution wins and um, you know with some of these things that Bill was Bill was wanting um, a path to something that would really be effective was not clear and um, you know so we were on, we were you know on, on a few things we were on an impasse um, but yeah it was it, there, there, there was nothing like a formal process and certainly Sun was not a company for processes Well, this might be the right era. You didn't actually, you said just a very brief thing about hot job of the browser and then the server. Is there any, anything more to add about, you know, as a, as a browser, the decisions that went into it? Um, um, and, did that, and did that increase the pressure about features once it became? The browser didn't, uh, none of them really created you know, neither Hot Java nor any of the server work really created a lot of, like, direct language features. They certainly pushed some of the APIs. Um, so, like, during the, the Hot Java period, um, I ended up working pretty heavily on the networking APIs. So, you know, people who, you know, I get all the blame for you know, the URL class um, and things around that. Um, but, the, but the language itself, um, yeah, not much. And so Hot Java was written in Java and it was just nothing right. particularly remarkable about it except that it was a web browser. Well, it, it was a web browser, but it was also one that, where you could embed new code. So you could put um, animations and interactive things um, into web pages. And you know, it would take quite a few years for that to start showing up via, via JavaScript and, um, and various other things. But um, yeah, Sun, Sun sort of decided that the landscape for web browsers was was a really really crowded and it was kind of hard to know why one would be trying to compete with um, Microsoft and the total horror story that Netscape had become. But I guess that I had just assumed it was done as a reference browser so you're, that's how it ended up but there were thoughts earlier on of yeah trying to be a general okay yeah yeah there were there, there definitely were um, but um, you know that that whole area kind of became a something of a a, a, a bonfire for everybody and you know the way that the, the guys at, at at Netscape basically committed suicide and and incredibly public forum was what, by not not keeping up better with Microsoft or? well they really pissed off Microsoft I mean they went out of their way to piss off Microsoft um, there was a a sort of a fake ancient Chinese proverb that sort of had some circulation, which was um, when building a cage around a sleeping tiger, don't poke it in the eye. Um, and they, they just kept behaving 
kind of crazy. And then, and then this, this bizarre thing happened where um, the, as the HTML spec um, grew, um, it, it turned out that, well, there were very various things about the inside of the Netscape browser that the way that it was built was just crazy. And, and so as the spec evolved, and, and in particular, once the, the, this thing called the DOM, the doc, document object model, really came out, um, there was no way really to implement the, the DOM on top of the Netscape browser. It was just nuts. Um, so they started this second project that eventually became uh, Mozilla. And um, because they just had to start from the ground up. Um, but, you know, the, the Mozilla project just took too long and got too crazy. And they, they died before it was really finished. And actually, one question from uh, Lou Montuli of, of Netscape for mm -hmm. you. He asked about the um, copyright of the Java APIs. And um, I guess because you did copyright. And whether about Java openness in general. What's your feeling? Um, so we tried really hard to be very open. I mean, the, we were distributing the source on day one. Um, it wasn't under any of the um, sort of free software foundation endorsed licenses. Um, it, we had this, this, this horrible tension um, because on the one hand, for the vast majority of people on the internet, we really, really, really wanted to just open source it all, do like a BSD style license, and life would be fine. The problem is that we had half a dozen competitors that um, were always up to games. And and, you know, it depends on the day of the week. I mean, the most common offenders were, were Oracle and, and IBM. Some of the time, HP was being really bizarre. Um, and, and it was just a com and, and and Microsoft was being really bizarre. Um, pretty much any large-ish company in, in that space was um, screwing around in, normally in, in, in ways that most people never saw. But we sure saw. And, and the kind of weird elaborate dance that we were doing that made no sense to anybody um, was making sense to us because of you know the way that Oracle tried to screw us last Tuesday or the way that IBM tried to screw us the week before. Um, and you know any of those guys would have would have would have would have crushed us in a heartbeat and um, we were trying to not get crushed. How much how much of contributions from outside were you actually incorporating? Um, actually, quite a lot. Um, in the early days, IBM uh, contributed an immense amount. Um, various outsiders like you know, the concurrency packages 
came from folks like Doug, Doug Lee. Um, it really was uh, an immensely large community effort. Um, you know, we we came up with this this thing, the, this Java community process, and that was that was largely Jim Mitchell's um, doing, and that was all about getting a way to get the community organized, and and in particular to do it in a a really transparent way, so that. Um, I'm going to choose my words carefully here, um, because what we were trying to do was both eliminate as much of the political game playing as possible, and when it happened, to try to make sure that it could only happen out in the open. Um, you know, we were trying to make sure that nothing could get in that didn't that was like the result of a backroom deal. Um, I mean, sometimes there were things that involved ungodly arm twisting. So like, at, like one that cost me about a year of my life was um, one of our, we, we had a, a QA team in, in Russia that was all like PhD mathematicians and they were doing a lot of the um, numeric QA stuff and they wrote the most insanely difficult test suites ever and they discovered a couple of, of Intel chip bugs and of course, then, that, then it turns into, well, are those a bug? Or are those, are those bugs, or are they exploiting vague corners of the, of the, of the, uh, of the floating point spec, you know, the IEEE 754 spec? Um, and, you know, it caused some really strange behavior. And, and so Intel, after much arm twisting, caused this keyword to appear called strict FP, um, which was a complete no-op on every architecture except Intel. Um, and it's actually a no-op now on all the Intel architectures because they changed the way they do rounding, and they've added, you know so their their sine and cosine functions did range reduction incorrectly, um, and then in later generations of the chip, there were um, extra sine and cosine functions that um, actually worked correctly. So. Um, you know, we came up with workarounds for the sine and cosine bugs, which caused sine and cosine to be a little slow. So if you benchmarked C against Java, they would look to be pretty much neck and neck, except for <coughs> benchmarks that involve sine and cosine. And, you know, the, the shit kicking that I, uh, Intel did, because they, they couldn't actually fix these bugs because if they fixed these bugs, then people's um, program behavior would change. Um, and, and so that just kind of like crashed and burned. Um, but if we, you know, one of the things we were trying to do was to make sure that we could have some, some way to avoid getting, um, getting totally slaughtered. So, I mean, at, after a while when it had, um, you know, we, 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 we finally changed the license to GPL. 
um, which actually didn't change much in terms of what people could do with the source. Um, and that happened in 2006, five, six. Something, somewhere's in there. Yeah. Um, I guess this is a related thing, but <clears throat> I mean, very early on, the, the strategy for rolling out Java was to make sure to just get it out there as widely as possible rather than to try to generate revenue from it. Right. Yeah. And I mean, how that was, I mean, was that Scott McNeely that helped m make that decision or? Yeah, Scott McNeely was certainly involved, mm -hmm. but this wasn't an act of charity. Um, and, you know, if you remember what, well, I don't know, you probably weren't around then and involved in things, but um, that was that was a period when when Microsoft was really terrifying the whole industry. And if you were a computer supplier like Sun or IBM or HP or DEC, anybody like that, one of the things that had happened um, was that um, Microsoft hired the, the Windows NT team from, or the, the VAX VMS, the VMS team from DEC who became the Windows NT core team. And they started building Windows NT. And so before that, their OS core, MS-DOS, was just laughably stupid. Um, and all of a sudden it looked like they're going to have a real OS underneath. And they could start doing, you know, sort of, higher scale stuff than just running, you know, VisiCalc. Um, and, and it would be like a real OS you could write real software on. And, and one of the things that happened when that started, when, when NT started to roll out, was if you looked at the, the community of companies that provide software, um, They they were in a quandary, right? So so if you were a computer company like IBM or or Sun, you know a, a computer is just a useless bucket of of metal and silicon, if unless there's software on it, right? So you you know as a as a hardware manufacturer, you're critically dependent on all the software vendors, and you know, you really care about things like how thick your catalog is of software. And what was starting to happen at high speed was that, you know, these, these software vendors really couldn't afford to do versions for all the different platforms out there. And so there was a, a community of companies that were largely Unix-ish, um, but not completely. And Microsoft had always been kind of weird, and because of MS-DOS, just completely unusable. But then NT starts to happen, lots of enterprises start making positive words about it, and all these software vendors go, you know what? You know, for our own, you know, our own health, we have to switch our development over to NT because that's where the volume is going to be. Um, and that was also creating another weird problem for um, the community of customers because a lot of the software was, you know, its scale was limited by the scale of the platform. So, so like, like if you were a, 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 a company that made like hotel reservation software, um, you could handle small hotels on Windows NT, but if you wanted to run like a hotel chain, like a big one like Sheraton, 
It couldn't run on Windows NT, um, but it could run on Sun. Um, but from the, the, the vendor's point of view, it's like, which do you go for, the small number of large customers or the large number of small customers? And more often than not, they, they voted for the large, large number of small customers. <laughs> so the, you know, everybody had these software catalogs, and the software catalogs were all co collapsing. And uh, since none of these companies really made a huge percentage of their revenue out of software, um, and they were all being sort of killed off by Microsoft, who was um, essentially sucking the oxygen out of the air. Um, it was somewhat opportunistic for, for people to go, you know, if we can make all of these, all of our different platforms look like one platform and run on, and run on Windows, then, and then get software vendors to run on that one platform, then all of a sudden this, this flight away from our, plat from our hardware stops because it doesn't matter, right? And you know, the, you know, folks at IBM and Sun and HP didn't really care whether it ran on Windows or not. What they really cared about whether, is whether it didn't run on, on their platform. You know, so folks like IBM and Sun, they were interested in running, you know, selling hardware to the to the Sheratons of the world, um, and and if they could make it so that the the software developers could, you know, didn't have to develop like a whole lot of different things, then then all of a sudden, you know, the world worked better for them. Um, so it was really about. Um, trying to level the playing field for, for software developers so that the, ca the software catalogs didn't shrink. Right, but the strategy was that, I mean, because Sun could have pursued a model of, well, we can, we can do that, but we can also try to make, make, make revenue from Yeah, the, the but, the, but, but, the, but the problem with that is if you try to make revenue from it directly, you slow it down, yeah. right, and the you know, the, the direct revenue that one would make off of, you know, a Java runtime or a Java compiler is microscopic compared to the, the revenue you would make from a large machine, you know, like an IBM mainframe or something. Um, so the, the, you know, making Java free was, Meaning was Java chump change. Java would help sell more Sun workstations. More, well, more Sun servers and Sun everything, and it would help sell. You know, it would, it would, it, right, yeah. right. So, so it, in in some sense, it was kind of a weird marketing campaign um, to to free the rest of the industry from the the stampede that Microsoft was creating. Um, I want to talk about the, the timeline. So, so Java comes out in 1995, um, and then, and you're still part, like at what point did you join Sun Labs? Um, and then at what point did, you know, was, did sort of the whole effort spin off into JavaSoft? Like what sort of was that? Well, timeline? so it, it I think that it sort of became a part of Sun Labs in like early 94. And it was sometime in like 95 or 96 that JavaSoft was formed. Um, but like I said before, Sun wasn't exactly a place for org charts. Um, so, um, you know, it was, it was a pretty fluid place. Right. So, you know, JavaSoft, 
I mean, at, at that at the point where JavaSoft was formed, it was clear that it was becoming a big enough of a business that they needed an independent independent unit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So at some point, Jonathan Schwartz um, became the joined JavaSoft. Um. Um, 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 um. So he had his company Lighthouse Design had been right, acquired. Right, they right they got they got acquired. That kind of fell apart. And they were a next step developer at yeah. before. Yeah, and and nobody understood why we bought Lighthouse. Um, you know. It, Everybody that I know that was asked for for a vote said no, but and I mean, Sun was also had a license to OpenStep at the time too, right? Like in '95. Yeah, yeah, and and by then I I had nothing. You know, I was like away from all of that stuff, um, so I don't know what the. Um, what that license was like, and as near as I could tell, um, the people at Sun who were driving a bunch of that were just crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was sort of happening completely independently from anything that you yeah. were doing or Java yeah, was doing. I wasn't involved in that at yeah. all. And were you? Um Involved with W3C very much. Um, Standards. A little bit. Um, I got somewhat, in, you know, in like '95 ish, there was this thing called HTTPNG. So the basic HTTP protocol spec was a fine thing for an afternoon hack. Um, but it had gotten like really way beyond um, its its original use case and needed some serious work. Um, and this guy, whose name I forgot, wrote up a proposal for something that came to be known as HTTPNG. I uh, really liked it, so I started getting involved in, in that, and I actually did an implementation of, of that. And, because um, I think his proposal originally came out in like, and actually in 94. Um, and I thought, wow, this makes a bunch of things way easier with the way that we would do applets and things. Um, then something weird happened. I never quite understood with it, which it was what what it was. It was like he had a had a health problem or something, and he kind of disappeared, and um, nobody really wanted to move forward with it because it was kind of his baby. But but in general, though, Sun and JavaSoft was, I mean, significant members of W three C. Yeah, but the. The parts that were around HTTP and and that we didn't get ter terribly deep with, um, yeah. But but for myself, the the only thing I really got into in any depth was the HTTP NG stuff. Was um, I want to talk about sort of the the libraries? So there was. There was AWT, and then that was replaced with Swing, yeah. another graphics library. So, like, why um, why did that have to be replaced? Well, because AWT, um, I mean, quite literally, what happened was um, we had this deal with Netscape, where we would incorporate the browser into the Netscape browser. Uh, we would incorporate Java into the Netscape browser. And 
At one point, Netscape told us, you know, you have like six weeks. And we were just getting started on doing, figuring out what the right UI toolkit was because the, the stuff that we would ha that we had had before was clearly inappropriate. So we had this, this like panic, it's like six weeks? You guys are nuts. You have no chance of being ready. Because we knew kind of what was going on inside because, you know, their offices were just a few blocks from where we worked. Um, and so we just did, the, did like the fastest, easiest thing we could do that would work, that we could get to be vaguely runnable in six weeks. And so that was a bunch of wrappers over the underlying um, UI toolkit. And we had to, we had to wrap both, both windows and the, the, um, the, 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 the Unix mo motif toolkit. And those were pretty different. And so to build wrappers that would enc encompass both of those at all well was fairly ungodly. Um, but it got us out of um, all the hard bits of you know, trying to do rendering, trying to do um, some of the tight plumbing into the, into the UI system of the OS, um, all of which were really, really hard to do. Some of the things that were just too ugly to do in six weeks, we left out like um, really decent support for cut and paste. So the thing that was AWT, um, it was something that we did in a mad dash and it just never felt right. I mean, it worked just fine. Um, it had a number of issues um, but because it was trying to run on all of these different toolkits, it became kind of a lowest common denominator thing, um, which was sort of okay for a while. Um, but then, um, and even though like, like IBM had participated in making it happen, they got really militant about how it just was not going to scale. They couldn't add features to it because it was dependent on the underlying on, on the underlying OS, and we knew it was a gross and an ugly hack. But it's what we had to do to make Netscape's deadline. Um, so then, then we started the Swing project, at, and you know we we figured we could do it in six months instead of six weeks. So. It was somewhat more thoughtfully engineered. But some of the things ended up kind of leaking through because we needed to interoperate so there were things in the, in like the event model that kind of leaked through. But um, it was sort of comical when some years later, when IBM released Eclipse, it had a, yet another windowing toolkit in it that was almost exactly a, a clone of AWT, which they had so soundly condemned. But their, their what do they call it, GWT? Um, it was like they did a wrapper that only covered Windows. So they only had to do Windows, so that made it much easier, but it wouldn't run anywhere else. And then they start this ungodly effort to um, make it work in other places. So eventually they got JGWT to run in other places, but it was just so comical that it was essentially a clone of this thing that they had been so angry about. Um, so, you know, politics, what can I say? Yeah. I heard that there, were, there had been a group inside Sun that had wanted to do um, a, a, a GUI framework that was more like um, NextDev. 
Yeah. Um, and and really what was, you know, the, the, the piece that was missing, I mean, in, in most ways, Swing was like the, the, the next framework. The, the thing that was different was that in, in Next, they had these, um, I forget what they were called. They were these, these files that were essentially a, a, a pickled, um, or, or, or a persistent file that represented a UI. And so that in order to, to build a UI, instead of saying... Oh, the nib file. Yeah, the nib file. So, so that you would just say, you know, read the nib file and, and it would create it. And... Um, They're like freeze-dried objects. Yeah. So, so if you look through the, the swing spec, one of the pieces of careful wording in all of them is about the, if you try to persist an object of a button or whatever, they would give you, you know, it gives you this sort of information about some of the funny corner cases. And when that was all built, to, built originally, um, the intent was that that, that that would be a nib file. It would, it would percolate to the, the, the swing equivalent of a nib file. Um, but when I, so one of the things that's kind of awkward about Scott, oh, it depends on which side of the fence you're on. Um, Scott really didn't like competing with customers. And so there were a number of companies that were doing developer tools, people like Borland and Symantec. And, and, and so he didn't want us competing with them. So we actually never built the tool that would do the, the nib file thing, even though we had built a bunch of the infrastructure um, for a, a nib file equivalent. Um, and of course, all of the, you know, once, once Microsoft um, really, really, they hugely dropped the price on Visual Studio. And then all of a sudden companies like Borland and Symantec, they couldn't charge enough for their tools to survive. So they all just kind of like died. Um, and then we ended up um, buying a company called Forte who didn't really do useful tools. I have no idea why we bought Forte, but we also bought NetBeans and NetBeans was, was wonderful. Um, but by that time, the sort of standard practice had evolved to where people were building UIs just by writing code that said new button this, new button that, add them to that container. Da, da, da. And even though it was not as elegant as the sort of pickled nib files, um, it's what people were doing. So the, the NetBeans UI tools they generated code rather than nib files, and although they did actually have it, you know, if you dig down in the um, in the NetBeans metadata files, there's something that's a lot like a nib file. You just never see it, um, and it, and it get and when the when your code gets produced, um, the 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 NetBeans kind of equivalent of a nib file turns into a piece of source code and turns into a .java file. Um, you could talk about splitting Java into the standard enterprise and micro editions. Nineteen ninety seven. Yeah. Um, well, that's because the business was going in different ways, or there were kind of like really different businesses, and. What was different about them was not so much, it didn't really have anything to do with the, the language itself, but it was all about the libraries, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, the, the micro edition was all about cell phones and you certainly didn't need a, a fancy UI toolkit and especially for, for cell phones of that era, 
you know, the, the, they were too tiny to have a fancy graphics library. And then on the other, on the other hand, the, 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 the enterprise folks, they wanted all of this complex stuff. Um, you know, everything necessary to, to, to run a, you know, a, a large terabyte kind of app server with, you know, links into databases and all that. And really it was, it was just libraries. But um, for kind of marketing reasons, they, they decided to call it editions of, of, of Java. And, I, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, you know, one thing that I think was, was really important for, um, for the long-term adoption of Java was how quickly it was taken up in universities and in, in undergraduate curricula. Yeah, and there, you know, one of the things that was interesting was that if you look at it sideways, it's a lot like Pascal in the sense that, um, you know, like, like in Pascal, if you have an array, out, array subscript out of bounds, you get told immediately. Um, null pointers do ugly things, you know, they, you know, you get yelled at. Um, you know, the Pascal is always considered a much more friendly language to teach people um, because it, it, it failed in clearer ways. The, the kind of the rules made a little more sense. Whereas with, if you're writing C programs, there are all kinds of mysterious ways that you can screw up and nothing actually bad happens until long after the real error. And teaching kids to program C is mostly an exercise in frustration. Um, and so Java comes along and it's got a lot of the sort of ease of learning that Pascal had. Um, plus it was something that you could actually turn into a career. I mean, one of the problems with Pascal was it never had any kind of um, commercial adoption. I mean, there were a few places, people who were using some of the Borland tools. Um, but that never got a lot, a lot of adoption. And, and kind of the, the, the Borland experience with like Turbo Pascal was one of the things that, that sort of fed into the discussion about should we give Java away? Because, you know, Turbo Pascal was pretty cool, but, you know, it had a price tag that many people found kind of daunting. Um, and, and it's not so much, you know, would big enterprises find it daunting, but, you know, would, would somebody back in, a, in a back room find it daunting to just try it out? You know, most of the adoption came not from people at the top saying, we will, we will buy this. It came from people at the bottom who were like screwing around and they, they try and experiment and go, wow, this is cool. You know, or wow, I just tried re-implementing that transaction server and there are no memory leaks. It just keeps on running day after day after day. You know, and then, you know, the results of those experiments percolate up and people start going, yeah. And I feel like, you know, I think a, a, a Java is in some ways maybe responsible for sort of the industry-wide movement to, into object-oriented programming, partly due to the, the fact that it was being taught in colleges now. Like, yep. Like, it, it seems and like- high schools. Yeah. And because I feel like you know before Java there was sort of a reluctance you know you didn't you didn't necessarily want to teach C plus plus or you didn't like there was a reluctance to teach. It seemed like Java provided object orientation, but also something that was used in industry and like there's all these things going for it that made it a good language. To well, teach. and and it was simpler and cleaner. I mean, things like the multiple inheritance in in C plus plus often really confused people and templates were always a 
source of much confusion just because they're a source of much abuse. I mean, the way that people use the, the, the C++, C++ templates is, is it, it just begs to be the winner of, you know, the obscure programming contest. Um, and, you know, and, and, and some of that comes from C++'s heritage as a, as a macro preprocessor on top of C. Um, and yeah, so it was, it was cleaner. Um, it was kind of weird, but you know, cer certainly Java did help make object-oriented programming mainstream, kind of the way it made multi-threading mainstream and garbage collection mainstream. Um, in 2000, um, the, what, the original JVM was replaced with Hotspot? Um, yeah, I think it was, yeah, that's about right. Mm -hmm. And Hotspot had originally been developed for Self, which was like a variant of Smalltalk? Um, or it's not, I would, well, it was a bunch of people who really liked small talk, but it was I never I never really got into the whole um, gestalt of of self very well. Um, but it was these these people who were trying to do a, like a little startup around some you know hot compiler technology to try to make um, small talk and self fast. There really wasn't a market for self because essentially nobody used it, but they figured that there was a market for small talk. But the market for small talk was pretty microscopic. Um, and, um, and so Sun, Sun bought the company. But it was, it was mostly a bunch of folks from Stanford anyway, so um, that worked pretty well. So what advantages did that new VM have over the old one? Um, it had a really good compiler. And the, the previous one, um, it, it was just an interpreter. There had been, for a little while, there had been the, the start of a compiler. Um, you mean a just-in-time compiler? Yeah. Okay. But, um, that one kind of died because the, the, the motivating performance problem turned out to have been because of a bug. And, and so there was like one bug fixed in, in Hot Java that all of a sudden made Hot Java go like a rocket. Um, and, and then it's like this, this just-in-time compiler that was, it was starting to turn over and it was, you know, it was well past Hello World. Um, but it got shelved because there was just too much other stuff to do. Um, and then the, the C compiler group built one that didn't really go anywhere because um, the only way that they could repurpose the, the, the C compiler to, gener to running for um, Java was to break the Java spec, which didn't go over very well. Um, and then, and then these, then the, the, the self crude that we, that we bought, they, you know, it took them a little while after we bought it to get something that really worked. And so it, uh, it does a bunch of, you know, moderately magical things. And the, the JVM has really become a host for a whole bunch of different languages. Right? Yeah. Scala, Groovy, Clojure, Kotlin, just to name four. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's become, I mean, would you say is it, well, I don't know if it's really eclipsing Java, but I mean, you know, how exciting is, is you know, the work that's being done in Java? Oh, it's really cool. It's really, really cool. Um, I mean, the, You know, from my point of view, all of the interesting parts of Java are in the JVM, 
and many things about the language that that, that kind of kind of bug me are all because of its history from C. Um, you know, some of which are slowly getting um, getting updated. You know, things like switch statements. Uh, they feel very 70s. Um, but, um, you know, that's all sort of, um, you know, from my point of view, it, it, the, the language syntax is kind of like window dressing. What actually matters is the engine underneath. And the JVM has proved to be significantly more flexible than um, I could have expected. And, you know, for people that are experimenting with programming languages, um, not having to build a crazy hot optimizer or uh, a really high scale garbage collector is, is a big deal. Um, can you talk about how you know important Java was in fueling the dot com boom. Um, I honestly don't know. I mean, it certainly made building a lot of these giant web apps hugely easier. Um, I mean, you know, once the, the people started doing app servers that were, you know, that, that, that could scale, um, you know, it certainly helped that a lot. I mean, lots of people did, um, like, formal evaluations of the, you know, programmer productivity in, you know, like, Java versus C, and all the studies were, like, better than 2x. Um, and so that certainly let people build a lot of stuff in the dot-com era. But really, the dot-com era was, was more about um, exploring weird and wonderful and sort of business models. And, you know, some of them worked and some of them were just crazy. And you know, it was, you know, fundamentally ended up as like this big filter function. So then you know, at, at, at some point, Java, you know, you, you sort of step, stepped back from, you know, day-to-day -day work on Java and went back to sort of working in some labs, just doing... Right. Doing, so what were you working on at that point? Um, so, I mean, I, I, I mostly stepped back when my carpal tunnel got bad. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after I um, had the surgery like four years later, I could actually build stuff again. Um, but by that time, the whole process had become so political. Um, you know, the, the way that, you know, the, 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 this community process with the sort of half dozen kind of bullies um, was really difficult for me and I just, you know, because I had been involved in some of that, you know, when kind of all I could do was talk. Um, but I wanted to do something that felt a little more productive. Um, and, you know, once I got my hands back, um, then I went into Sun Labs um, and just started building stuff. And, you know, one was, you know, some of it was just like internal tools. Um, one of the bigger things I did was I got involved in the, the NetBeans folks after we had acquired them. And I did a bunch of prototyping of refactoring tools. And that was just huge fun. And we can skip this if you want, but, you know, um, what's your view of Android's use of Java? Um, it's a mixed bag. I mean, the fact that they use it, I think, is great. Um, it helped them a lot. Um, the way that they, and particularly Andy Rubin, treated Sun, uh, another story. 
Um, and is that one you can, you're willing to tell a little well, bit? Well, um, I mean, if you want deep t details, you should talk to a guy named Vineet Gupta, and he will tell you in gory details. But, but fundamentally, what he wanted us to do was to do a, a total open source um, in a way that would give them all of this stuff for free. So we had the, the, the license that we had um, was allowing us to get revenue from companies like, like IBM um, as a part of like, like maintenance contracts and stuff like that. And um, it, and really the thing that we w cared about the most that was in the, the not exactly open source agreement was, was about um, maintaining interoperability. And we really cared about interoperability. I mean, that was one of the big, but, but everybody, I mean, it's kind of like all standards, right? The people who join standards associations to promote the standard, they all say they want to promote the standard, but really what they want to do is turn the, the standard into an entrapment device. You know, so, you know, they'll, they'll implement SQL, but they'll add extensions that make it impossible for people to run their apps on other platforms. And, and do it in a way the way, you know, they'll, they'll add extensions, but then there'll be patents on the extensions so that other people can't, you know. So it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's kind of the, the worst sort of forking that kind of everybody wanted to do. Um, and they wanted the, they, they, they wanted an arrangement where we lost all possibility of any kind of revenue and all possibility of any kind of um, enforcing interoperability of any kind. Um, and we didn't actually care about the, the revenue as much as um, the interoperability thing. And um, we made them some proposals that were, would have been pretty cheap and I think in the end would have been fine for them because they, they eventually realized that, you know, the universe has a lot of tooling around Java, and if you start breaking things by too much, things fall apart. Um, and one of the things that the Android folks had done was they had um, adopted this graphics library. It was kind of crazy, but they adopted it because it was free. Um, and so we actually made an offer to them that was actually pretty cheap. I mean, for, for a company like Google, I'm sure they pay more for that for lunch in a day. Um, but they didn't want to be, they didn't want to be part of a community of people that sort of were in the debate. They just wanted ownership. And um, it would have been so much cheaper for them to do that than engage in this crazy lawsuit with Oracle. Um, but, you know, so, so like I said, it's sort of a double-edged sword. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's nice that they did that. But, you know, they're How they, how they, 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 they sort of, you know, raised you know the pirate flag and the and the middle finger, um, and were actually pretty abusive to a bunch of people, um, was not good. You know, so I often get asked about like the, the the Oracle, Google lawsuit, and you know, you know, like which side is is right, and it's like. Neither of them are right. You know, they're both bad actors. They should, you know. Although, you know, in in sort of Google's defense, it was, you know, a lot of the misbehavior was centered on one individual. So, but since he was the guy in charge, it was like. Are you comfortable talking about your six months there? 
at Google in 2011? Um, I, it was odd. Um, only got a few minutes left, but um, there was a, you know, I, I, I felt a certain sense of bait and switch because it became really clear that one of the reasons that they wanted me was for help in their court case with Oracle. And um, I thought that both sides were pretty reprehensible. And I was, you know, they, you know, when they were trying to hire me, they said, you know, when I said, look, I can't participate in that court case. They'd say, yeah, fine. And then afterwards, you know, like lawyers start calling me up and say, well, so we'd like to get your opinion on. It's like, sorry. You know, and, you know, I was asked about you. Can you participate? Can you testify to this? And I said, well, I could testify, but I guarantee you won't like my answer. You know, there are no answers I can give that, you, that will make you happy or imp improve your case. Um, you know, and just like the, the crazy ageism at the place. Um, you know, that's, that's very real. Um, I mean, there's a certain amount of that at most of the companies in Silicon Valley, but um, Google certainly six years ago was seven years ago, eight years ago. Um, <laughs> was pretty extreme um, and you know I have a number of friends who were there for quite some time early on and you know they you know the gray hairs are a huge problem um, so to close out um, could you talk a little bit about your work at liquid robotics and now at Amazon um, so Liquid Robotics was probably the coolest, most fun job I'll ever have. Um, autonomous robots in the ocean, um, having to commute to Hawaii, um, having an engineering test site that was on a wharf in Kwai Hai Harbor. Um, most of my testing was, was done two or three miles offshore and snorkeling. So I can't imagine another software job that would require me to spend a couple hours a day in the water snorkeling, um, surrounded by Ono oh and Ahi and humpback whales and um, It's like, oh, swimming with turtles, and it's a job. Plus, you know, doing software for collision avoidance of these, of these robots that have to be out there for months and months and months at a time, um, and surviving extreme conditions. That was just like huge fun. And the devices were really, really cool. But, you know, then when it turns into hunting submarines for Trump, um, after getting acquired by Boeing. Yeah, it wasn't working for me. So, now I'm gonna add Amazon, which is um, a company that I'm really enjoying. I've been there for a couple of years. I like the fact that they're, there's no inherent conflict of interest in their uh, um, business practices. They, I mean, you know, places like Facebook, they, they're, fundamentally profiting off of your personal private information. Um, you know, their revenue is a violation of your privacy. And IBM, or Amazon's revenue, you know exactly what you're paying for with, with Amazon. There's no, there's no um, hidden agenda. Um, things are pretty obvious and all all ages of people, all nationalities. It's uh, um, it's a real blend of people. It's an enormous company, but you know, pretty good. And your work there is also job related, right? 
Um, it's kind of all over the map, but it's, yeah. Yeah, there's some of it that is quite Java related. And what, what was your one word for young entrepreneurs? Play. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>